Well, hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe and quite an exciting week. We're uh, recording midday Thursday, and so the market is actually down right now about 250 points. I don't know what will happen. We were down over 300 a few minutes ago, and yet it's interesting. We're still up about 150 points on the week. So uh, the markets have been up quite a bit Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of this week. I'm going to talk about why in a second. Then we're dropping off here today, and I'll talk about that why as well. So uh, we'll see where things kind of end out. But uh, quarter four, fourth quarter of the year, final quarter of the year is here. And, and uh, what, a, what a year. Uh, just surreal that we're in October right now. Um, but as far as this week goes, let me just kind of make this week as simple as possible. I got to do the housekeeping stuff first because there's some stuff I personally don't want people to miss. Those that are consumers of our content, I am kind of fond of some of this stuff that I want to make sure you're aware of. And that's the only reason I'm, I'm pitching it to you that way. Listen, uh, our advice and insights podcast this week, um, I do about a 25 minute special podcast about the lessons investors learned and need to continue learning from the financial crisis. So we kind of uh, uh, concluded a, uh, our series on the financial crisis, 10 year anniversary. And I think that this final podcast has a lot of punch to it that may be of interest to you. Speaking of that series at marketepicurean.com, 10 parts, 10 short articles commemorating different events in the crisis. That also was concluded. If you missed that, feel free to go to the website. All of those series of articles are there. And we're soon going to have one link that will have all 10 of them together. Um, and we're also going to publish a little booklet that will have a kind of hard copy print of the, of the whole deal. Um, but with that said, the DividendCafe.com this week it is very heavy with charts. Last week was very heavy with charts as well. Um, there's stuff I could never really cover here without the ability to show you the charts that I'd like you to go to, particularly kind of, re, you know, covering some of the things that happened in third quarter. I have an incredible chart contrasting the emerging market bonds divided by the U.S. Treasury and trying to illustrate that we're not seeing enough distress or barely any distress in the emerging market bond world to justify where valuations presently are in the emerging market equity world. So there's some things like that that I think are more powerfully uh, illustrated visually. But just in terms of the kind of takeaways for the week that I'll give you here as you're watching the video. Um, the market removed much higher as this narrative has sort of continued about these trade deals that basically Canada came on board. <clears throat> They've renamed the proposed trilateral agreement with Mexico, Canada, the U.S. They're not going to call it NAFTA anymore, but it's essentially a redone NAFTA. Um, it, it, it isn't very drastically different from the other one, more of a name change than anything else. A couple things I think get a little bit better from a market standpoint. A couple things I think get a little worse. Um, but the fear of a prolonged trade tension with our northern neighbor and, of course, ally, Canada, um, that has kind of weighed on markets, that tension got removed and markets rallied four or 500 points in a couple of days. And, of course, that's after about 3,000 points in the last few months, largely just driven by the tailwinds that are, that are in tension with the headwinds of the benefits of tax reform and corporate profitability and strong economic growth versus these trade headwinds that were self-imposed but nevertheless there. It's the big reason why I think the shorts are desperately afraid of the issue of China. I happen to think that there's plenty of reason to be concerned on the China front. I don't think the Trump administration will get to settle the China matter as easily as they, they won't be able to get out of the trade tensions of China as easily as they did with Canada, EU, and Mexico. However, if they do, I think the shorts, I've used this expression before, it's very common trading lingo if you didn't know it, but I'm going to share it with you now as an insider to the Bonson Group with our Dividend Cafe video. The shorts are afraid of getting their faces ripped off. It's a rather graphic term. It's one we use on about a daily basis in the world of managing money. 
But I do think that if all of a sudden there's some headline and some press conference and some announcement with China and, and President Trump, that the market could be very vulnerable to melt up. Now, on the other hand, uh, from a risk reward standpoint, the notion of assuming that that's going to happen, I think is equally silly. Um, there are more uh, ideological and cultural dynamics at play in the US-China relationship than just simply trying to kind of pound away at a better trade deal. So we have to watch that very carefully. I think it's a legitimate uh, issue. Um, okay, as far as markets this week, besides the, the Canada deal pushing markets higher, then we had the, uh, the stuff Wednesday night, Chairman Powell, Federal Reserve, made some comments. Interest rates today, Thursday, have hit their highs on the year in both the 10-year and the 30-year. Ironically, all my bank stocks are up today so far because the yield curve is widening a little bit. So this is something you're going to have to get used to, and that is the goalpost moving um, rather substantially around what is the thing we're supposed to be afraid of. Are we supposed to be afraid of inflation? Are there all of a sudden deflationary pressures? Are we supposed to be afraid of a, a flattening yield curve or inverted yield curve? Or are we afraid of higher interest rates? Now, all those things are legitimate, but the point is it can't be all of them at once, right? And I think that what you're seeing right now is um, a very interesting dynamic whereby interest rates are at their highs on the year, which means treasury bonds are at their low on the year, and yet uh, equities are essentially a couple hundred points from their all-time high. They made an all-time high this week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So the narrative that I've been preaching against as long as I can remember, and I've given data, I've given historical records, and we've talked about it at length, but this notion that higher interest rates inevitably mean lower stock prices has no basis in history and is obviously not true now. To the extent you get meaningfully higher interest rates, that the market fears will go higher still. Then you have to reprice equity valuations relative to a different discount rate and it can cause equity market volatility. However, higher interest rates because of a stronger economy is good. It is good for stock market prices. And that's what we've been seeing for quite some time. So um, all that to say, the other things that we covered this week in Divin Cafe that I'll quickly give you a comment on. Interesting to see large cap stocks that have made new highs and small cap, which had been leading the market this year, falling off in the last several weeks, even as markets have been moving higher. And uh, emerging markets, it's interesting to try to get a tell out of because they were down so much in Q2 and U.S. equities were up so much in Q3 that how do you interpret emerging markets in Q3? Because relative to U.S., it was a wide differential. U.S. markets were up quite a bit and emerging markets were down roughly 1%, but emerging markets have been down you know, double digits in second quarter, so you could argue a lot of the bleeding sort of stopped. But uh, we just think it is one of the great contrarian calls that we're going to make we are very patient with it, and we may have to be patient with it, but we really do believe that all the sentiment pent up against emerging markets is a great um, argument against being out of the asset class, a great argument for being in the asset class. Uh, third quarter's behind us. U.S. equities were the place to be to get a U.S. equity return. Anything you went in beside U.S. equity took away from your U.S. equity return um, whether it be Europe, emerging markets, U.S. bonds, global bonds, commodities, real estate. Uh, so the uh, asset allocated portfolio um, had mixed bags and that is of course the way asset allocation is supposed to work. Um, but Q3 was a very strong quarter for U.S. equities and for the economy. So earnings season is still a couple weeks away. We're here in early October. We're taking on jobs numbers and some of the other economic data, that's where we are. I'm gonna leave it there for the week. I am off to New York City next week, um, and, and I do this annual trip. Uh, two other members of our investment committee, Brian and Dea, are joining me. And we, uh, the week following, the week of October 15th, meet with all of our asset management partners and hedge funds and portfolio uh, teams that we have deep relationships with. 
It is an annual due diligence face-to-face -face time and we always come away with a lot of actionable ideas and a lot of perspective that I think is important. As far as um, uh, where we are with our portfolio positioning, there are some tweaks that we're making on the edges, but right now we feel balance and, and prudence is the way to go and we're very happy with how we're allocated. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there for the week. Thanks always for watching and listening to Dividend Cafe. Reach out with any questions and have a wonderful weekend.